Welcome to Guilty or Not, where we take a look at the world's most gruesome cases, analyse them, and try to figure out why the perpetrator did their horrible deed. Grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea, find a cosy place, and let's dive into the case of Hella Crafts. For this case, we're heading to Newtown, Connecticut. Newtown is a scenic, small town that was known as the safest place in America until the tragic events of the Sandy Hook school shooting. But there was a lesser-known tragedy that took place many years before the 2012 mass shooting. The 1986 murder of Hella Crafts. Hella Lork Nielsen was born on the 7th of July 1947 in Charlottenland, Denmark. She was an only child who grew up in a small village and was known for her vibrant nature. Hella enjoyed school and had a knack for picking up languages with ease. By the time she moved to England to attend college, Hella spoke French, English, German, Norwegian and Swedish at differing levels. After college in England, Hella au paired in France. While in France, Hella got a job with Capital Airways as a flight attendant. She thrived in this role. People loved Hella. She was engaging and absolutely beautiful. She would then move on to Pan Am Airways after hearing the airline was looking for flight attendants in Copenhagen. Hella was one of 200 candidates who applied and one of only eight who were selected. The job required Hella to travel to Miami for training courses. During this time, new recruits stayed in a motel that was close to the airport. On the 24th of May 1969, it was in this motel that Hella met 31-year-old Richard Crafts. She didn't know it at the time, but this meeting changed the course of her life forever. Richard was an airline pilot who had been born in New York City on the 20th of December 1937. His father was a successful businessman, former World War I pilot and college football player. Richard finished high school and later dropped out of college to join the Marines in 1956. During his time in the military, Richard learnt how to fly helicopters and gained his pilot's licence in the late 50s. After his time spent abroad, Richard was back home in the US in 1966. He got a well-paying job with Eastern Airlines in 1968 and would meet Heller the following year, during which time he happened to be engaged to someone else. Hella carried on getting to know Richard despite this and despite him often having relationships with other women. The two somehow gravitated towards each other. They fought a lot and would take frequent breaks from the relationship but always seemed to end up back together. Hella's friends did not approve of her relationship with Richard but in 1975 Hella found out she was pregnant and the two would marry that year. Hella and Richard moved in together into a home in Newtown, Connecticut. In total, the couple would have three children together. Hella continued her work as a flight attendant, and Richard continued his as a pilot. 19-year-old Dawn Marie Thomas au paired for the family to help care for the children. Richard's job meant he spent long periods away from home, but this wasn't the only thing that was putting strain on their marriage. Behind closed doors, Richard was abusive. This is what one of Hella's close friends would tell police later anyway. There were also occasions when Hella was seen in public with bruises on her face. She had reportedly told a friend that Richard had treated her terribly during her first pregnancy and things didn't get better after all the kids had been born. Richard would come and go as he pleased, disappearing for days and not telling Hella where he was or where he was going. Richard also had complete control over the household's finances. He purchased things like mowers and tractors, and even a $25,000 backhoe. Not that he used them, they just sat in the yard, which over the years turned into a real eyesore. In 1982, Richard took up something new. He became an auxiliary police officer in Newtown. This wasn't a paid position, but he took it very seriously. Keep in mind, Richard was still a pilot with Easton at the time. He was often in and around the police station, and there were occasions where he responded to police calls despite not being authorised to. Four years later, in 1986, 
Richard got an official position as a police officer in the neighbouring town of Southbury. He earned a measly salary and even forked out his own money to attend seminars and purchased a 1985 Ford Crown Victoria, the type of car used by the Connecticut State Police. This Ford was fitted with radios, police lights and a siren. Again, all out of Richard's pocket. By 1986, things were on the rocks for Richard and Heller. He had maintained multiple affairs throughout their marriage, something that she reportedly tolerated for the sake of their children, or to keep up the appearance of a happy marriage, and Heller had gotten to the stage where divorce was on her mind. That summer, she got herself a divorce attorney, and went on to hire Keith Mayo, a former Connecticut police officer who was working as a private detective. Keith was tasked with gathering evidence against Richard. It is unclear how long Keith had been working for Heller when he made the following call to the Newtown Police Department on December 1st, 1986. Keith called to report that his client, Heller Crafts, had gone missing and he suspected that her husband may have murdered her. Keith insisted that Heller's appearance be investigated right away. He was able to tell police that Heller had left home on the 19th of November and was planning to go to Westport and visit Richard's sister. Heller never arrived and hadn't been in contact with anyone since that day. Her car was found at Kennedy Airport, conveniently in a Pan Am Airline employee parking space. Since he had worked with the department, Richard was far from a stranger to the detectives. He spoke with them on the 2nd of December and he confirmed what Keith had said about Heller's movements. Heller was supposed to go to his sister's home in Westport since there was no power in their area due to a storm. Richard went on to say that he hadn't seen or heard from his wife since the day she left. There wasn't much concern about Heller's disappearance until some other information started to come out. All of Heller's friends, co-workers and neighbours agreed on one thing. Heller was a devoted mother. She would never up and leave her children. Richard's affairs were brought up, as well as the fact that Heller had just recently found out about a long-term girlfriend that Richard had in New Jersey. Richard had told different people different versions of events about what had happened to Heller. And then a friend of Heller, Lena Johansson, told something chilling to the police. She claimed that Heller had said to her, quote, If anything happens to me, don't assume it was an accident. End quote. This was said to Lena in early November. The other person that police spoke to was Dawn, the au pair. She told them that Richard had woken her up at 6am on November the 19th and told her that Hella was driving to his sister's house and that they would meet her there later. This struck Dawn as strange. The reason that the electricity was out was because of an unusually violent winter storm that had blown through the town during the day. Hardly driving conditions. Richard then insisted that the children needed to go to his sister's house, so he loaded them in the car along with Dawn, and they left at 6.30am. Dawn recalled that Richard left practically right after he had dropped them off. He came back at 7pm to pick them up. Even though Hella had supposedly left before them, she was nowhere to be seen. Dawn also mentioned that she had noticed some missing pieces of carpet from the master bedroom. Having heard from multiple people about the different stories and the suspicious events of November the 19th, Newtown Police got Richard in for a polygraph test. The problem was, he passed. Things were adding up and it didn't make sense that Hella could have simply disappeared. With this, he was called in for another interview. But they were still unable to get anything incriminating out of him. The case would end up being handled by the state police investigators and when the Western District Major Crimes Unit started looking into things, they found some interesting facts. They looked at his credit card purchases and phone records from the time before Heller disappeared. Robert had purchased a large freezer at a store in Danbury on November the 13th. It cost $375 and he picked it up from the store on the 17th. The detectives also noticed that Richard had rented some sort of machinery that cost a whole $900. Over the 1986 Christmas period, 
Richard and his children were in Florida. This is when police executed a search warrant of 5 Newfield Lane. They found a home that was in tatters. There were dirty clothes all over the place and the dirty dishes were left in the sink and along the counters. The carpets had all been pulled up. There was a freezer found but it had nothing inside it. They didn't know that this wasn't the freezer that he had newly purchased though. That one wasn't in the house. It had already been thrown away. The search lasted a few days and over 100 items were seized as evidence. This included a seemingly endless list of guns, which were from Richard's private collection. He had been a gun fanatic, and one of the places he often disappeared to was gun shows. A luminol test was also performed in different spots throughout the house, and this did test positive for the presence of blood. Unfortunately, they still didn't have an answer to where Helicrafts had gone. The next development was learning that the piece of machinery rented had been a wood chipper. Richard had picked up the brush bandit wood chipper on November the 19th and supposedly used it to chip some wood. Then Joseph Hine enters the story. He was a utility man who had been working on River Road ploughing snow. Joseph had seen a wood chipper and a U-Haul on the side of the road. It was the middle of the night. He thought it bizarre at the time, but was now able to pass this information on to detectives. And even better, Joseph was able to point out the exact spot that the wood chipper had been parked. Piles of wood chips were visible along the riverbank. A search team was on site within an hour and a perimeter was set up. Then the search began. It was painstaking work, but a picture began to emerge. Envelopes with what appeared to be Hella's name were found, strands of blonde hair, pieces of bone, cloth, plastic, wood, and unidentified items, all of which had been put through the chipper. The riverbank wasn't the only thing that was searched. Divers also braved the icy waters to sift through the mud for any evidence. In the end, they would find 2,660 strands of blonde hair. 69 slivers of human bone, 5 droplets of human blood, 2 teeth, a truncated piece of human skull, 3 ounces of human tissue, a portion of a human finger, 1 fingernail and 1 portion of toenail. They had found Helicrafts. Richard Crafts was arrested on the night of January the 11th, 1987. This is what police believed happened to Hella. She was bludgeoned in the bedroom, indicated by the blood drops found there. Richard then carried her body to the basement and placed her in the freezer. He headed back upstairs, woke up dawn and got everyone out of the house. During the day, Richard then cut up Hella's frozen body with a chainsaw, indicated by the chainsaw chain found in the lake, and placed the smaller remains back in the freezer. He then waited until the following day to go out and put Hella's remains through the wood chipper. The trial took place in New London, Connecticut, and despite a mountain of evidence expertly presented, there was one man on the jury who would not budge from finding Richard not guilty. This meant that it was declared a mistrial. The venue then changed to Norwalk, Connecticut, and the second trial began on September the 7th, 1989. This trial was practically identical to the first. All the same evidence was presented and all the same witnesses testified. When it came to the jury to decide, it took them just eight hours. Richard Crafts was found guilty. He was handed a sentence of 50 years in prison. As of 2020, Richard was out of prison and living in a halfway house for veterans. He is currently 84 years old. This was the horrific case of Hella Crafts. Let us know in the comments, what's your take on it? Was her husband responsible for her murder? Or was someone else to blame? We're always interested to hear if you think he is guilty or not. Until next time, keep your eyes peeled all the time.